So learning a language or learning about language even is, is kind of a tall order at times. There's a lot of going, a lot going on. There's a lot of rules and, uh, you know, vocabulary and things that you have to do. And it can be a lot to take on. And then you find out there's a lot to learn about nonverbal. And you're like, what nonverbal? This is all even more vague and ambiguous and, and, and hard to get a, a handle on. And you're like, oh man, this is, this is really getting tough. And then though, when we talk about nonverbal and culture, and find out that different cultures have different, not only different language, but also have different nonverbal uh, communication cues and traits. And it's just like, uh, it's, it's just, whoa, mind blown, right? The number of variables that are possible in in all these different cultures have an all different kind of nonverbal cues and things. And the ambiguity there is just incredible. So we need to try and reverse this, this, you know, whole blowing of the mind and talk a little bit about nonverbal communication and culture. Okay. So let's do that. Let's talk about nonverbal communication and culture. We're going to specifically talk about the different kinds of nonverbal channels or codes um, that you can have just in general, the, the categories that we have for these things and, and how, um, call, how these kind of fit into culture and how we can adapt and adjust um, for culture based on these things. Kind of, okay. So number of codes, we're starting with here. So we're starting with body movement or what we call kinesics, right? The, the technical name is kinesics. So um, uh, if we talk about body movement, this is a whole category of things. And so if we're going to talk about a few things within this, um, but body movement has to do with anything that has to do with your body, starting with uh, uh, perhaps the number one most expressive feature of your body communicatively, which is your face. Your facial displays are incredibly important. We express a lot. We wear our emotions right here on our face a lot of times, right? Um, whether we're happy or sad about something, whether we're irritated or bored or I mean, people can usually tell just by looking at your face. And the good news is some of these are sort of universal, uh, but then when you get into like, how do people smile and how much do people smile? Well, that varies from culture to culture. Some cultures, if you smile just at random strangers, or, you know, in the United States, maybe you think that's polite. If you're smiling at people, depending on where you're from, I guess, it may be polite. But in other cultures, they may see that as kind of laughing at them in some way. So, I mean, they may not just smile at random people. Uh, and this is not part of their personality. So facial displays are, are important nonverbal expressors, but they can be different um, from uh, culture to culture. Now, again, a smile is a smile is a smile, but how do we use that smile? When, when is it appropriate to smile? And uh, those types of things could vary from culture to culture. So even our face, starting, uh, starting right off the bat, our facial displays could uh, could be very different from culture to culture as to how we should use them, what's the most appropriate way to use them and to employ them. Uh, another part of kinesics that we could uh, look at are eye behaviors. This is another really important um, distinguishing characteristic for different cultures if, as we look at cultures around the world. Um, for example, uh, some cultures very much see eye, eye contact as an important aspect of you know, in the United States, we look at somebody, are they maintaining eye contact? We, we determine, use that to determine truth. Like is somebody telling us the truth? If they're not looking us in the eye, then they're not telling us the truth or at the very least they're not paying attention or whatever. Uh, but in other cultures, it's, you know, kind of rude to just stare at somebody and just to have direct eye contact and maintain that steady eye contact is considered sort of rude. It's just not something that they do. So it's a cultural thing to not maintain eye contact at all times, which is different for us, but it's something we need to recognize that eye behaviors, of course, can be very expressive. They're a very important nonverbal indicator, but what they indicate can be strongly influenced by uh, culture, and it can be very different from culture to culture. Uh, also, things like uh, postures, another part of kinesics, you know, with, again, uh, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate in terms of posture and how we, how we hold ourselves. And then also gesturing is another one. Um, and this is true for individuals. Some people are very expressive with their hands and their gestures and things. Other people are not. Uh, and the same thing is true for, for cultures or some cultures, you know, we think about uh, Italian cultures uh, oftentimes are labeled. Um, people who are Italian are oftentimes um, labeled with being very gesture heavy, right? Or um, classically, um, people who are um, from a, a Jewish background tend to be portrayed as having uh, uh, more uh, gesture, uh, gestures, using that more. Um, but, you know, but not always. It depends on the individual too. And then there are lots of people who are neither of those things that are also uh, very gesture heavy. So, but, but culturally, 
And then what do those gestures mean? Right. When we when we hold up our hands in this way, what does that mean? You know, if we were to give the OK symbol, for example, here in the United States, I talked about this in another video. This is this is the United States. It means OK. Right. I'm OK. Uh, in another culture, if you did that to somebody, they would think you were calling them a very bad name or indicating something about them. You're, you know, you're basically referring to them as a, as a part of your anatomy and it's not very nice at all. Um, so it can it can vary from culture to culture what the gestures mean. Okay, so we need to be very aware of that, um, that gestures do have an impact uh, not only on how people understand us, but but culturally how they relate to us and uh, and what those gestures mean, what those different movements mean, what the facial displays mean, um, incredibly dependent on the culture. And so we need to be very aware of those things. Another big one culturally in particular for nonverbal is touch. How do we use touch as part of that culture and, uh, and and how much touch is appropriate? And of course, just in general, there are different types of touch. Of course, there's um, there's a, a touch that you use for people um, who are your loved ones when you touch them on the arm or you give them a hug or, you, you know, things like that. And then there's the touch that you have when you go to your doctor and they're they're, you know, probing and checking things and that, that, you know, that's a very clinical touch, right? Uh, so there's, there's touch that's appropriate. There's touch that's not, you know, we deem as appropriate or inappropriate. And that all depends on context, even here within our own culture, whatever your culture is would depend. Uh, there's, there's appropriate and inappropriate touch. But then if we expand that globally and look a little more at different cultures, um, we, we know that there are, are cultures that are just more touch heavy and just in general not in an affectionate way necessarily in a, or not in a, not in a sexual way. Right. Uh, but just a, as, as a matter of, of course, of touching people, uh, typically, um, cultures that, um, stand a little closer where their personal space is a little, um, smaller, you know, then, then they tend to be more touch heavy. You know, it was a study that one that, uh, that, um, uh, researchers did just studying people at a cafe at cafes or coffee shops. I found that in Puerto Rico, the average number of touches in, in that conversation per hour was uh, somewhere in the range. It was over 100. It's like 108, I think. Um, but in England, the average uh, hourly is a zero, for example. Right. So um, it just depends on the culture. The cultures use touch differently. And, and so we need to be very aware of that as well. Okay? That uh, the touch is, is very culture dependent. And uh, so... Um, yeah, it just has a large impact on on how we view touch and how we use touch and and all along those lines. Uh, another cultural uh, indicator is para, as a para language or our, how we use our voice. So again, here we're not talking about verbal communication. That would be like um, uh, the words that we use. We're talking about how we use our voice then to express those words. How loudly do we speak? How what at what rate do we speak? Um, what kind of tone do we adopt? Um, and that depends culturally as well. I mean, again, culturally around the world, but culturally uh, from one neighborhood to the next. You know, um, we, we find that the people who live in, uh, for example, there's been research on on uh, poverty, and uh, so people who live in generational poverty, meaning extended, long term poverty that is extended through generations, this is not a temporary thing, uh, but tend to, to speak louder because everything tends to be louder. They have their TV turned up louder, and, that, and different, for different reasons, they tend to talk louder. Um, and I grew up in an area that's pretty quiet, you know, it was pretty remote, so uh, we didn't talk loud. So anybody who came through the area that talked loudly, I could never understand that. Um, but and oftentimes it may have had to do with uh, a poverty thing, and that's a cultural thing as well. So how we use our voice, though, will depend on on culture. And so we need to understand that a lot of times these things aren't it's not a matter of good or bad or right or wrong. It's just a matter of different. And what's the norm for you and in your culture? And, and are there things we need to adapt to in order to be effective intercultural communicators um, the, the way that we use our voice? Uh, space or proxemics is a significant one, right? How, how close are we to other people physically? What's the amount of physical space? And then how do we use the territory around us in general? Um, you know, in the United States and in, in a lot of similar westernized cultures, we kind of have this idea of intimate space, which is people like our, our, our really close loved ones. So parents, children, spouse, people like that are in our intimate space, which extends up to about a foot and a half. Anybody who's within that uh, kind of bubble uh, ought to be somebody with whom we're, we're fairly intimate. Um, then we have a personal space that extends out to about four feet. 
So between a, a one and a half feet to four feet, that's our personal space. That's close friends uh, and close acquaintances. People that we're really comfortable with can kind of be in our personal space um, without any issue. Um, but if it's a stranger and they're in our personal space, then it's a little different. It's a little, uh, you know, it's a little more sketchy. We're a little more concerned about that. And then out beyond that, we have then a social space and a public space for people that fall in different. It's just a matter of how well we know these people and and uh, how comfortable are we are and how far that bubble extends. For us. This is again in the United States is just kind of a general. And it depends on from person to person, but these are kind of our general. Uh, limitations. But if you go to some place like Mediterranean cultures, so Spain, Italy, Greece, those types of places, you're going to see a much smaller personal space. They're going to be closer to you when they're speaking, right? Um, so the, your personal space is going to shrink. I'll just warn you as a Westerner, if you go to some of these you know, Mediterranean cultures or places like that, that have um, less personal space, they're just going to be closer to you. They're going to be probably within uh, a wrist length. In the United States, we say, okay, arm's length, that's personal space, kind of, or, you know, intimate space and a comfortable personal space ought to extend from arm's length and, and then out. In you know, these types of places is going to be kind of more of a wrist length, right? So almost like, basically, they could have their hand, they could have their hand resting on your shoulder while they're talking to you. You're going to be that close. That's just the norm. Right. Uh, and I will tell you somebody who's lived in that area and, and did live, had an opportunity to live in that area. It is amazing how quickly you adapt to that. And it just becomes the norm. And I've, I think I've said these videos before, when I came back I'm from living in Spain, specifically when I came back, my friends were constantly like, dude, you have got to take a step back. Why are you standing so close to me? And it's just, that's what I got used to. The personal space was much smaller. So that, that proximity, that personal space was just different for that person. It can be different for individuals here in the United States too. The classic Seinfeld episode about the close talker and that you can check out. But uh, so personal space here in the United States can vary from person to person. But then there are also, of course, cultures where the personal space is larger. You, you think about a lot of East Asian cultures, Japan, um, uh, South Korea, China. Those are places that have typically have more personal space between, you know, their, their personal bubble tends to be a little bit larger just as a norm. So it really just depends on where you're at and establishing the norm and understanding what that is for that particular culture. Okay. Uh, chronemics is another um, nonverbal code that is very important. Again, one we've touched on before in another video, but we had, so you have mono, monochronic and polychronic cultures. And this is a spectrum. It's not an either or thing for, for cultures or for an individual. Um, but uh, so monochronic, though, tends to view time as a, uh, a commodity. And uh, so, for example, here in the United States, you hear the expression time is money. Uh, and so a very strict um, view of and relationship with time. So meetings start on time. They end on time. When somebody says this event starts at eight, you show up at eight not nine or somewhere around then, or, you know, it starts at eight, it starts at eight. So you ought to be a few minutes early, really. Uh, that's a very monochronic view of time, very rigid view of time. Polychronic cultures tend to have a little more relaxed view of time. Time is not a linear thing specifically. It's more of a ribbon that kind of ebbs and flows. And, and so they take it a little, you know, when you, you know, in, in Europe, for example, a lot of places, in, again, around the Mediterranean, some of this starts at eight and it, it that means somewhere 8.30, 9-ish, you know, show up around then. If you showed up at 8, you would be extremely early uh, for something starting there. So for anything in a polychronic um, culture, that would be the case. So just understanding that, that different cultures and different people view time differently. As odd as that sounds to somebody, especially from a monochronic society, people view time differently. And uh, it's just something to understand. Um, our physical appearance is something that we're going to um, to look at as well. Um, we look at people and say, you know, I can relate to people with this. And we use physical appearance to express ourselves um, with what we're wearing. You look, you know, you walk along the street and you see people dressed in all kinds of different ways, some more formal, some less formal, um, some with, you know, may have colleges on their shirt or sports teams that they're supporting or bands that they want to, you know, advertise or whatever or, or support with what they're wearing. And, and so our physical appearance, though, will... Uh, be important too. And then you think about things like, okay, well, people dress differently in different cultures, right? Around the world, people just dress differently. And so uh, how does that make you stand out? I was just having a conversation with somebody the other day that said, when I lived in Spain, one of the things that was a dead giveaway that I was an American and people had no problem spotting me as an American because I wore a baseball cap everywhere, which was not the norm there. People didn't, just didn't wear baseball caps at all. 
that style of, of hat. And so it was a dead giveaway for me as a Westerner, as, a, as somebody from North America, really. So um, physical appearance is another one, though. It's a way that we express ourselves and that we communicate nonverbally and culturally. It's a way that we identify um, both with cultures and a way that we stand out from other cultures. Uh, artifacts are another uh, nonverbal code. Artifacts basically are, is just stuff. It's just things that we have and that we wear and that we, that we use as a, again, as a way to express ourselves. It could be clothes. It could be, uh, but it could be, you know, tattoos. It could be, um, uh, any of the things that we're carrying with us. So for example, if you're wearing a, a shirt with the university on it, that you're supporting, that you're, you know, ostensibly saying that you're a supporter of that, you that's an artifact that you're a fan, right? Or that you're carrying a basketball or carrying whatever. That's an artifact. These are things that we use to express ourselves to, um, to non-verbally don't have to say anything, um, that I'm going to assume that this person is a Michigan fan who likes to play basketball. And so because of the artifacts that they're using, you know, um, we see this professionally, we see doctors that, uh, that wear certain clothes, right? They wear scrubs and they have, they have ID badges and they wear the, the, the funny hats, right? Or like I said, people with, you know, tattoos and nose rings, things, those, those types of things are artifacts that allow people to express themselves. And sometimes it's both because believe it or not, these two pictures are of the same person. This is Dr. Sarah, right? Dr. Sarah Gray from Australia. And, uh, and she is uh, self-proclaimed the most tattooed doctor in at least the country, I think, but uh, I'm not sure about the world, but, uh, but so um, artifacts go along with this. That, so she has things that identify her both as a doctor, but then identify her in other ways as well. It's allow her to express herself in, in other ways as well. So, um, so artifacts are ways that we uh, communicate non-verbally and express ourselves and identify things about other people. Environment's another non-verbal code. Uh, we use the environment around us to express ourselves and, uh, to, uh, to express and to identify what a situation is. So uh, even if you just think about like a workplace, the comparison between like an open workspace as opposed to a cubicle farm, right? What does that tell you about that workplace and about the expectations of those employees and, and how they are to communicate and work together and, and what the situation is? Um, those are two very different workspaces and they communicate two very different things, right? So uh, our environment and the environment that we establish as an organization, for example, but even as individuals, then what's our work environment like? That says something about us when we communicate non-verbally in that way. Uh, and then things like our car. If I were to take a ride in your car, what would that tell me about you? Uh, does it need a wash? And does it, you know, would I have to sweep things off the seat in order to be able to sit down there? Uh, or is it like spick and span? Is it like a museum in there? Right? So our environment is another non-verbal code. Um, and then the last one I'm going to really talk about here is, is smell. Is another nonverbal code that we use. It's the way that we, again, express ourselves in our in our expressive, uh, and uh, nonverbally. It's called olfactics, right? So we use our sense of smell to identify things about people, but also just to kind of, um, uh, you know, culturally, but you know, we identify what we like as a smell, for example. Um, different different cultures will use different smells in cleaning products. In the United States, you see lots of cleaning products with lemons because we identify that with cleanliness, right? For whatever reason, lemons are clean for us. So uh, cleaning products aren't naturally lemon scented necessarily. They add that because it's 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 a signal. It's a cultural thing that, you know, lemon is a good smell. It's a clean smell It's for whatever reason. So here in the United States, that's why cleaning products are lemon scented oftentimes, right? So, uh, but our smell, we use this to express the, ourselves nonverbally and, and it's a nonverbal, but that can be different from culture to culture. What smells good here is not the same as what smells good in other places. And so, uh, so that smell may be different. The cleaning products in other cultures may be different. Uh, it may have a different scent to them for that reason. So, yeah. Okay. So I think the first thing we need to do after, uh, going, kind of going all through all this is, is just take a deep breath. First of all, I know this is a lot to take in. Not only is nonverbal a lot and these channels can be a lot and just thinking about this can be a little overwhelming, but uh, then thinking about how again, it's all magnified even more when you think about different cultures having all of this could be different in different cultures. I mean, it's hard enough to kind of get an idea of what the nonverbal signals are in your own culture, let alone think about it being different for every other culture. So take a deep breath. It's not that bad. It's a matter of study and it's a matter of, uh, of being conscientious of these things. And it really comes down to, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's famous for talking about the, the 10,000 hour rule, right? The 10,000 hour rule says that if you look at any kind of cognitively complex field, from playing chess to being a neurosurgeon, uh, we see this incredibly consistent pattern that you cannot be good at it 
unless at that, unless you practice for 10,000 hours, which is roughly 10 years. If you think about four hours a day, okay. Now, I'm not saying it's going to take you 10 hours to really, because we're not really trying to, to necessarily master this in a way that we hope our neurosurgeon has mastered this, but, but we ought to be conscientious of these things. We ought to work at it. I mean, it is tough. It's rough. It's, it's, but it's something we ought to work at because it's worth it. Uh, if we're going to be competent intercultural communicators, we have to be cognizant of the fact that the, that nonverbal communication is an important aspect of communication, no matter where you're at, uh, and that nonverbal signals can be um, varied from culture to culture and can be ambiguous and that can make things complicated. But despite all of that, it is worth it. And it is important, an important aspect of intercultural communication to put in the time and the effort to be effective um, at, and be willing to, um, to, uh, to grow in this, uh, this aspect of our communication skills. If you have questions about nonverbal skills, about um, anything related to nonverbal communication, really, but specifically as it relates to, uh, in particular, intercultural communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. Uh, in the meantime, I hope that this has helped you understand the importance uh, of nonverbal communication in culture, uh, specifically, and why it's worth our time and effort to uh, enhance our skills in this really, really important area of communication.